So the eight-week camp you mentioned, what might, what might work there would have that eight-week camp with the families while they're deployed, you know, preferably close to the end of their tour. So when they come back, we can teach them, okay, now they're going to be this way, they're going to have a hard time sleeping, and it'll look a lot like jet lag at first because the time difference in coming back is, is so that's going to be part of it. But the whole overall thing, it might be a two-month jet lag where they just feel kind of sluggish and they don't want to do things and they feel kind of awkward and and somebody will ask them about well how was it over there and they're not sure whether they want to say well it was really hot and dry and and you know or whether they want to say well it was terrible there was a lot of shooting and so they don't know how to you know they don't know how to answer these questions and they feel you know so if we could do the eight week camp and have the family prepared for these things so that when these people come back, they can, they can bring them in and, and nurture them. I think we've got something going. But we, it's extremely hard to get the veterans to come in and see us themselves. They just don't want to risk it. And this is, this is, that's still the issue with Vietnam veterans. These guys don't want to come in because if they come in, that means they're going to get well, that means they're going to lose their compensation. They don't understand you're never going to get well in the traditional sense. Like I, uh, I'm 70% disabled with PTSD. I get every day, every day I get to be conscious of whether I'm being reactive or responsive. Every day I get to notice my irritation at my, at my coworkers. Every day I get to notice my penchant for complaining about things instead of taking action about them. Because that's what we did in Vietnam. You know, the Vietnam veteran complained about everything. They'd say, you're gonna take this hill. And we'd say, oh, again? Why do we have to take this hill? This is so stupid. We already had it once, now we gotta back, Ugh. And it doesn't change anything. But we vent it. And then we saddle up and go do the job. But see, we come home and we complain to our wives and all they need to say is, and? And then we'll do the job. But instead, say, oh, honey, well, what can I do? And, and then we go, hmm, hmm, there's cheese down that too. You know, I'm going to act that way. So it, yeah, it perpetuates itself. But information is, is the champion here. Learning what you're going to be facing when this veteran comes home. And the veteran coming in to learn, you know, there's no excuse. PTSD is no excuse for bad behavior. You just get a hold of yourself. I mean, these guys have done the tough, toughest thing life, these guys and women have done the toughest thing that life has to offer, they've gone to war. And so monitoring themselves a little bit, it's difficult and it's a pain, but there's no reason you can't have a fruitful life. There's no reason you can't have a full life. There's no reason the marriage you had with your high school sweetheart can't still work out. You just both have to make this Herculean adjustment to the effects of war we could get them in and the viewers the people out there the citizens what can we do you can ask them if they're okay and when they say I'm fine say no I'm serious are you okay are you sleeping well are you eating right you know is are things okay with you especially if you notice the agitation the anxiety and you engage with the person just like I said about thanks for your service. Thank you for putting yourself through what you've been through. It's a much more personalized approach than, hi, how are you? Fine. Which becomes automatic. And that's what they're noticing now is it's almost automatic. They're speaking to the uniform, not to the person. And so if people on the street would realize if you've been in a war zone, it doesn't matter if you're a cook, it doesn't matter if you're a truck driver, if you've been in a war zone, you have been stamped, you have been marked, and somebody needs to talk with you about it. If only just to say, you know, you're, you're handling this really well. But mostly to say, if you're as committed to managing this as you were to staying alive, you won't lose much. You'll still have a great life. You just have to get real conscious for about 90 days so that you can set habits of self-monitoring. 
get your people in. Get your cousins in, your nephews in. Just have them come and talk. Or else you sit down and say, how are you? They say, oh, I'm, I'm okay. And say, how are you really? Are you sleeping well? Do some follow-up questions. Be willing for them to say, that's none of your business. I promise you, they won't say that. They'll appreciate the personal concern. And they might say, okay, so how do I get a hold of these people? And now we're working together. That's the way I would rather have your tax dollars work. I'm, in, I'm involved with a, an organization called the Hospice Veterans Partnership. And this is in cooperation with the Veterans Administration and various hospice providers. See, every veteran of the United States Military Service is entitled to hospice care in an end-of-life situation. If they have a catastrophic disease, cancer, or one of those, and they're dying, dementia, and they're dying, they, they can either have hospice care, complete care at home, or in a facility at the government expense. If their Medicare and Plan A and Plan B doesn't cover it, the Veterans Administration will cover it. And we've been asked to do some coaching with those people because a veteran's end of life needs are a lot different than regular people's. First of all, like I mentioned earlier, they're going to, uh, we're at a phase now, like I'm in a phase, okay, let me speak personally. I'm in a phase to where most of my life is over. Not most of it, but at least more than half. When I was 20, I'd look up and I'd say, I'm troubled, I'm but tough, but you know, if I take 20 years to clean myself up, I still got four, I'm only 40. And then when I'm 40, it's like I'm still troubled and still not at my goals, but I, I'll get on it. And if it takes 40 years, I'll only be 80. But when you're 65, you know, if you haven't achieved things in your life and you're looking at things and your children aren't, you're not correspondent with your children, you've lost touch with your children, they've never understood what PTSD was and they thought you hated them because you yelled at them a lot or you wanted to make them work because that's what productive people do is they carry their own weight, they don't live on food stamps or whatever notion you have about it. For whatever reason, your kids are still alienated. It makes it hard to say I've lived a good life. It makes it hard to say my life has mattered because we come down and total up the columns. A lot of my Vietnam veterans that are coming in now are people that began to get really melancholy. It's a real common phenomenon. See, that's the, like myself, I, I was 40 years after the Vietnam War when it crippled me. Everybody would look at me, I had a great job, I had a great corporation, we were making tons of money and doing tons of good, but yet I was severely broken. I was a workaholic working 120 hours a week. And I would use the other time to get some sleep and then I'd get up and I'd go on. I didn't have time to fret. I didn't have time to worry and ask myself second guessing questions. But when I had time to think and I'm writing my life story, I say, I wonder if I'd have made this decision if that guy would have been killed. If I'd have just done this instead. The second guessing game, you know, just, just virtually runs one's run. It's an endless hole. And so the Vietnam veterans that are out there that are noticing that life's kind of mundane and they're beginning to say I'm old now and I really don't matter. They need to, they need to realize that, you know, they're the senior citizens now. We are the elders. We are the ones that get to lead the young and we get to take responsibility. We don't get to abdicate. We were activists, right? Those of us that weren't stomping around the jungles were stomping around in the streets. And I was saying, let's change the world. We know how to do those kind of things. And Vietnam veterans often just kind of sit back and say, I was the bad guy, you know. I went and did that awful war and I did those awful things. And, and uh, you know, and besides that, we lost. You know, we're the first group of people that lost a war for America. You know, and I, I prefer Bear Bryant's statement, the old coach of Alabama. He'd say, I never lost a football game. I ran out of time sometimes but I never lost a football game. But PTSD will be there waiting to be treated as long as you're alive and it's never too late. I'm seeing veterans that have been just completely overwhelmed for 40, 45 years begin to have some sparkle about them and begin to 
realize that their experience can save a new generation from 40 years of what they've been through. And they're becoming pretty active. They're becoming pretty active. It ain't over until it's over. That's what Yogi Berra said.